In my seminars the last few years, I have covered what I have found to be those few simple basic principles that can make major changes in life and lifestyle. One of those subjects that gets the most comment is diseases of attitude. And out of that subject, worry and how to kick the worry habit have caused the most questions. So in this brief visit with you, let me give you my best look at worry, how to recognize it and define it, and what to do about it. And hopefully, these ideas will give you a good chance for confidence over worry. First of all, worry might well be killer number one. And if it is not the number one physical killer, although doctors tell us worriers die sooner than non-worriers, and we have all heard the expression, worry yourself to death, at least it is the number one killer of dreams and achievement of energy and vitality and lifestyle. I know the damage and effect of this killer, worry, firsthand. I will spare you the details, but over a period of some three years, I let worry get out of hand. As I've mentioned before, I became a super worrier. I was good at it. The combination of small and big worries about my circumstances, what people thought of me, my finances, my abilities, the future, my progress, all led to a complete physical collapse, a stay in the hospital, emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion, and a deep despair I couldn't shake. A sad picture for a young man who should have been well on his way to carving out his share of opportunity. I am happy to tell you that good fortune came my way, and as many of you may be aware, I met a man, Mr. Earl Schof, with his ideas and inspiration and the help of a very close friend. I worked my way past the minefields of worry and disaster and out into the clear air of mental sunshine. And if I did it, anybody can do it. I'm not saying it's easy. It took me almost a full year to kick the worry habit. It took practice and much effort, but it was well worth it. Remember, don't ask for the task to be easy, just ask for it to be worth it. Don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. Don't ask for less challenge, ask for more skills. Don't ask for less problems, ask for more wisdom. It's the challenge that makes the experience. And life and its color and meaning and adventure for you is this collection of experiences. To wish them away is to wish your life away. So let's get to worry and what it is and what it does, how to define it and what to do about it. And let's do it with eager high hope that it won't be long until you will be free of the worry habit and on your way to the life and lifestyle that you want. First of all, let's define worry. There are many ways we could describe it. Worry is fear painting pictures in your mind. And if you watch that mental movie too long, you get a false picture of how things really are. Worry is a mental broadcasting station, and more often than not, it is false or at least distorted propaganda. Worry has that sneaky way of stopping short of giving you all the facts. Worry is often the trickery of mentally filtered facts on the negative side and the bold declaration that these are all the facts. Worry has the mental audacity to suggest that the elevator only runs one way, down. Many times worry is a five alarm bell for a wastebasket fire. And worry is a depletion of constructive emotion. It's wasted mental energy. It's like letting the starter run the battery down when the car won't start. And worry is most often a lack of all the facts, a lack of full understanding, a lack of total information, and an unpreparedness of ability, knowledge, talent, courage, faith, and all the other virtues. That should give us a better definition of worry, and remember, left unchecked, it can become like a mad dog loose in the house, and the sorrow and pain and regret is too large a price to pay not to do something about it, 
and to do it now. So much for what worry is. The next question is, what can I do about it? What is the first step? My best advice on this is to first recognize worry for what it is. Admit what it does, and then decide you now want to be free. It first starts with decision on your part. And may I add, well, you should decide. Why let worry continue to take money out of your pocket and bank account? Why let worry any longer keep you from becoming all you can be? Why let it rob you of better friendships, better business, better profits, better results, better communication, better family relations? Why impose your worry on others any longer? It's a burden you can get rid of and a monkey you can get off your back. Why not be rid of those sinking, nagging feelings that all is not going to be well, that you can't do it, that it won't work out for the best? Worry is undue concern that takes up too much of your mental and emotional time. Now we must all be concerned. Hey, life is no joke except to the jokers. Life and how to live it is a serious matter. It is risky, full of peril, and there are constant threats to the good we want and to the pursuit of happiness. However, it is undue concern, or concern that takes up too much mental time that begins the harm. It's like a family planning a wonderful trip. While they certainly should be concerned about the condition of the car, the tires, and making sure they pick the proper route, it would be foolish to allow themselves to be completely turned negative with the thought that they might crash and kill the entire family. If that were the case, even if they went, the entire trip would be turned into one nightmare of fear with the specter of chaos looming around every curve rather than enjoying the wonderful trip they had planned for themselves and their family. A lot of people do that with their entire life. So, start to make these declarations. And if you mean it, they will start you on your way to confidence and adventure free of the worry habit. Say first, I've had it with worry. I'm tired of being beaten down and hassled with all those negative mental pictures. I refuse to be tricked by false facts. I'm really not that weak. Never again do I want those sick feelings inside, those mental false alarms. I'm tired of the drain on my resources. I'm tired of the embarrassment of the lack of confidence. I don't want people, especially my family, to see me in this state anymore. I've got more to offer. I refuse to let my life be short-circuited any longer by letting my mind run wild with a distorted view of the facts, whether I bring it up or if it comes from someone else. Prove it to yourself. Think back over all the things that you worried about, all the fantastic catastrophic events that your well-meaning advisors had told you were going to happen. Be pleased that none of them ever happened to you, or else you would not be alive today. Ninety percent of the things you worry about never happen anyway. All of us have had these well-meaning advisors who want to appear larger in the eyes of those they wish to advise, and who immediately rear back and describe every single bad option they can think of that might possibly happen. By the time they have finished, the one who has come for some confidence and some help wonders why he even bothers to live anymore. And the fact is, those things are never really going to happen anyway. Bring to question now what your mind tells you or what others tell you and pledge not to go for false alarms. I've had it is a good beginning. This first step will start you arguing with your worry thoughts. Soon you will start to examine your fears and worries to see if they are valid and you won't let your mind play those mental tricks any longer. It is possible to destroy any emotion you have, including worry and fear, by a very simple process and that is, analyze it to death, drag it out on the table and look at it. 
Weigh it against all of your past experiences. Make sure this one can stand against all the past facts you have. You will now start to use worry instead of letting worry use you. It's a beginning, being in control instead of out of control. You will now let concern and the first signs of worry prompt you to learn, ask questions, and look at all sides in order to evaluate true, positive, constructive action. Now you can say, I will let fear advise me of the facts, but I won't let fear tell me these are all the facts. Nor will I let fear determine my reaction to the facts. I will gladly take up the war of faith over doubt, reason over fear, and positive expectation over worry. So talk to yourself right now into a change of attitude. Be persuasive. Go all out. Show yourself the hell if you don't, and the good life of answers and progress if you do. Say to yourself, what a fantastic feeling it must be to stop the panic drain on my mental energy, emotion, and physical strength. Imagine putting all that saved energy and emotion and strength into my action plans for the good life. Hey, accept the challenge. Believe your beliefs. Doubt your doubts. Stay on the campaign to give worry a bad time. Like being your own conscientious judge, say, I've had it with the presentation of a one-sided story. I sustain the objection that worry has failed to bring out all the facts. I despise these mental courtroom maneuvers that try to belittle my client, me. I demand the whole truth. And if worry will not be silent, I may cite him for contempt of the court of reason. Call up that scene often when worry wants to hassle you with the same old tricks and the same old results. It will work every time. Okay, let's move on to some really positive steps. If you can survive all that has happened to you up to this moment in your life, in spite of doing and thinking many of the wrong things, imagine how you can succeed by now starting to do some of the right things. First, the best answer to worry is confidence, and confidence starts first with awareness. Here is one of the most important lessons in life to learn. Life and business is like the changing seasons, and the real challenge of life is to learn how to handle the winter and take advantage of the spring. In short, that's it. You see, winter always comes, but so does the spring. Night follows day, but also day follows night. Sure, the tide goes out, but it always comes in. Opportunity follows difficulty as surely as difficulty follows opportunity. For this subject, however, let's talk about how to handle the winters. Those times when worry like winter takes its heavy toll. So, we tell it like it is. Winter always comes, so does the night. Some happenings in our life will always be a cause for concern, and sometimes concern turns to worry, and worry turns to fear. But remember, that is to be expected. Each day, each event, each season brings both expected and unexpected challenges that we must think about and make decisions on. Life is like a stream that flows continuously. The better we understand that, the better chance we have to produce good results out of all of our challenges. Here's some of the best advice I have on worry. First, don't be afraid to face the facts of life. It is not negative to understand that the winters always come. Don't be faked out. Don't clip the word impossible out of the dictionary. Sure, the Bible says all things are possible. Don't say I don't want to hear the problem. I don't want to see the difficulty. Don't show me the weeds. Don't say anything negative. Only see the positive. That's foolish. There is a thin line between positive thinking and kidding yourself. And remember, 
there's also a thin line between faith and folly. Here is the key. Humans have the unique ability to see it as it is, and they also have the ability to see it better than it is. One is called fact, the other is called faith. Faith you develop, facts you acquire. The facts you acquire are essential. It's like belief. You constantly must find facts to support your belief. Here is a good prayer. Help me to see it as it is, and help me to see it better than it is, and then inspire me to act. Facts and faith and action. What a combination for personal progress. And so we come right back to the theme of our entire enterprise, self-development. Learn to work harder on yourself than anything else. The key to all success in economics or mental health is self-development. It will all change for the better when you change for the better. It's what you become that really counts. And you are the only variable. So a good statement is, you can't be all positive. You can't be all confident. You can't be all faith. But confidence and faith and courage and inspiration can dominate worry and fear. Make sure you give yourself the best chance to get mental and emotional domination over all of your challenges. And here is one of the master keys to the good life. Developing the intelligence and accepting the challenge of putting all of your emotional experience into their rightful ratio. Beginning this progress can bring about the most dramatic changes. You see, disappointment is like winter. It always comes. It is foolish to say, don't be disappointed. But you must learn to discipline your disappointment. If it dominates 51% of your time, you're in trouble. Continued heavy disappointment is like 12 months of winter. And 12 months of winter leaves very little alive. Use the guidelines of seasons to adjust to all the meaningful things that happen to you. So concern, fear, and disappointment, like many human emotions, serve a useful purpose as long as they are kept in their rightful ratio. Left unattended, the weeds take over. Disappointment rules. Worry breaks loose. Fear gets the upper hand. And doubt moves in. But managed, worked, given human action with will and knowledge and purpose, and gardens overcome weeds. Faith overcomes doubt. And confidence pushes worry into a small place. The second major key to mastering worry is to respond. Build up inside of you that heavy desire to be free, to get on with building your life and lifestyle. Too much is waiting to delay. Take a new look at your opportunities. Figure out new ways to seize them immediately and make them work for you. And here is a key. Bring a new dedication that you will master yourself with enough discipline to be more than qualified to do the present job and prepare yourself for the next move up. Expose yourself to every stimulation possible that will put all this in perspective. Now let's move on to a very important point, and that is the best answer to worry is confidence. First, self-confidence. I can better handle next winter. I have a strong shelter. It is stocked with supplies. I now know how to take advantage of the spring. I'm going to plant better crops and bigger crops. I can last through the summer. I won't quit this time. I'll study weeds and how to get rid of them. I'll be less frightened of the changing weather and the quick storms. In the fall, I will exercise more care and reap what I have without complaint and blame nothing for the amount of my harvest. I'll learn to save a fair portion so that I can survive the bad seasons when out of control the hailstorm comes and it all goes wrong. 
Now we must consider this. The most fatal deterrent to self-confidence is guilt. Not doing all you know how to do to the full extent of your present ability weakens the foundation for confidence. The biggest part of worry comes from the lack of this personal confidence. And lack of confidence comes from two major things. First, no goals or plans. And second, no daily discipline to achieve. The inaction to cure or handle small tasks is what starts the guilt process. And that always tends to make you look at what's wrong and expect the worst. So listen to the voices of creative experience. Let nature, experience, wisdom, books, everything speak to you and teach you. Remember, both opportunity and challenge await action. Everything yields to diligence. It's not what you can do, it's what you will do that counts. An undeveloped ability comes from three problems. First, lack of inspiration to find out. Second, lack of reasons to learn. And third, lack of applied time and action for developing those abilities. Remember, humans are remarkable, a marvelously functioning entity. Imagine how uniquely your body and mind have survived and managed to function in spite of all the worry. Humans don't die easy. They die hard. Develop a plan for your life rather than aimlessly drifting through it, the victim of circumstance. Create your own environment and learn to control it. You control your own mental environment by developing yourself. So go on a crash program to clean up decisions. Get things done. Get other things set up and started and organized. Start doing all the things that would make you feel better. Exercise, diet, reading more books. Open a floodgate of positive moves in the right direction. And be thankful. Add up what you do have. Make an actual as well as a conscious mental list of all you possess. Tangible as well as intangible. In view of the four billion other inhabitants of the world, Yours is probably an incredible list. That list and being thankful should then lead to the big step of discipline. The discipline to sit up and listen. The discipline to pay attention. The discipline to give people and kids the gift of your attention. The discipline to be alert. Take care of yourself. Rest. Eat properly. The discipline to talk well and practice good manners. Courtesy is contagious. Take one day and see what a variety of positive steps you can take and projects you can take on. At the end of the day, go over it. Write out the positive steps, the progress on projects, the rest, the exercise, the meals, the hobbies, calls, records, conversations, and letters. And speaking of calls and letters, write at least one encouraging letter or thank you note and make at least one encouraging phone call or thank you call every week. Then have a friend help you, as one helped me, to get all the facts and prepare for action. From such a friendship, the greatest gift you can draw is the truth. To one of my dearest friends I said just the other day, as my friend, do me the one best thing you can do for me, and that is, tell me the truth. From there I can grow. I can start making wise decisions. To sum it all up, first understand what worry is. You now know that it can be beneficial and destructive depending on your awareness. Next, resolve to be free of the habit. That job is up to you. To work on yourself. To get the right attitude. Next, start the daily action of first cleaning up all your current situations. Remember, little achievements lead to confidence that conquers guilt. Then buy up every challenge to reach your goal. You can now handle it. The winter, the spring, the harvest. Bring a new zeal to every problem, to every fear, to every opportunity. The inspiration from it all 
and the immediate and future progress that will someday give you a view from the top of your goals, your adventure, and your achievements. Now we're going to take some time to actually start designing the next 10 years of your life. We're going to start setting your goals. Goal setting is one of the most important skills to develop if you want to design your future. I'm going to give you enough homework not only to keep you busy for the rest of your life, life you may have always dreamed about living but never believed possible. So let's get on with it. The sooner you exert the discipline, the sooner you will be enjoying the results. Once the results start to come, believe me, you won't mind the hard work and discipline it's going to take. Now, get a sheet of paper and at the top of it, write the words long range goals. I'm going to ask you some questions and I want you to jot down the answers. If you don't have paper and pen handy, follow along with me now anyway, just listening. Then later, listen again when you can write down your ideas. After I've asked the questions, which is the first part of this exercise, you can stop the tape and work on your answers. All right, let's start this exercise. The basic question you are going to answer is, what do I want within the next one to 10 years? I want you to take about 12 to 15 minutes and make a list of at least 50 things you want within the next one to 10 years. These are long range goals. To help you get started with your list, consider these questions. What do I want to do? What do I want to see? What do I want to be? What do I want to have? Where do I want to go? And what would I like to share? Now with these thought starter questions in mind, answer the basic question. What do I want within the next one to 10 years? See how many things you can write down. At this point, don't take the time to describe in detail everything you want. This is the time for you to let your thoughts pour, to write fast and to abbreviate. For example, if you just write down 380, you'll know what that means. You don't have to describe the color and the interior of the car. You'll do that later in this exercise. I want you now just to abbreviate and write fast. Make the list as long as you possibly can. Try to write down at least 50 items, 50 things you want within the next one to 10 years. These are long range goals. Spend about 12 to 15 minutes on this. After you've completed your list, you're ready for the next part of the exercise. Go through your list and next to the things you think you can accomplish or acquire a year from now, write a number one. Next to the things you think it will take three years to realize, write a three. Next to the things it will take five years to accomplish, write a five. And next to the things it will take 10 years to accomplish, write a 10. Go through this list now to the best of your ability and say, that looks like it will take me about a year or three years or five years or 10 years. Some big goals might be out there 10 years from now. Once you complete this part of the exercise, you might come to the conclusion that you need a lot more three year goals and less one year goals, for example, or that you need more 10 year goals. You see, while you're working on one goal, you must have something else in the planning stages. If you don't, what happened to some of the early Apollo astronauts could happen to you. After they came back from the moon, some of those astronauts experienced deep psychological and emotional problems. And the reason for that, why after you've been to the moon, now where do you go? That seemed to be the end, the finish. What later astronauts did was to make sure that they had major projects lined up after they returned from the moon trip. The way you enjoy life best is to wrap up one goal and start right on the next one. Don't linger too long at the table of success. The only way to enjoy another meal is to get hungry. Another thing to check for on your list is that you have included goals for each of these three important categories. First, make sure you've listed your economic goals your goals for income, profits, and productivity. Second, make certain your list includes material items you want. 
tangibles, such as a home, a car, a boat, furniture, or jewelry. Don't attach the wrong importance to things, but they are important. Third, you'll want to include on your list goals for personal development. Write down all your personal development goals, your goals to be more physically fit, to lose weight, to be more decisive, to be a more effective leader, to be a better communicator, to learn another language. Of course, there are other types of goals to consider, family goals, social goals, lifestyle goals. This is pretty heavy homework, but remember, whether or not you do your homework shows up in the marketplace as well as in the classroom. After you have determined which of your goals are one year, three year, five year, and 10 year, and after you've made certain your list includes economic goals, things, and personal development goals, I want you to go back to this list again. Now pick out the four most important one-year goals, the four most important three-year goals, the four most important five-year goals, and the four most important 10-year goals. Those 16 goals will give you plenty of work for now. Get out some more paper, and in a brief paragraph, describe each goal. How high, how long, how much, what size, what model, what color, for example. Also describe why it is important to you. This is a process where you either talk yourself into it or talk yourself out of it, which is good. When you're unclear as to why something is important, usually you put only half-hearted effort into it. What you want is a powerful motivator, but the reason why you want it is an even more powerful motivator. It has greater pull. You may find that some of your goals you thought at first glance were important are not important after all. Do some reflecting, refining, and revising. The point is, right now, try to have approximately four one-year, three-year, five-year, and ten-year goals that you truly believe in, that inspire you, that you've sold yourself on. When these goals and the reasons you want to obtain them are each clearly described in a brief paragraph, transfer this information to a journal or some type of notebook that you can carry with you easily and refer to often. It's essential to set aside some time every week to review all of your goals, to rearrange them, redo them, restructure them, to add goals, or to tear up the whole list and start over. Goal setting is not something you do just once. It's a continual process. Also, you must constantly check your progress toward your goals. You don't want to fall too far behind on, or worse, lose sight of, your important goals. Now, just as important as your long-range goals are your short-range goals. Your goals for tomorrow, next week, next month, six months from now. These are goals you can accomplish within the next year, the immediate future. We call these goals confidence builders. When you work hard, burn the midnight oil, and accomplish these little things, it builds your confidence to go for your long-range goals. Write down in your notebook or journal all the little things you would like to have or accomplish in the next year. How you set up this list is up to you. You might want to break it down by week or by month. Set it up in whatever way works well for you. Part of the fun of having a list is being able to check off something as obtained or completed. Every week, try to check off at least one thing on your list of short-term goals. And when you are able to check off something major, something on your list of long-range goals, celebrate. Make winning joyful. Congratulate yourself. It is very important to celebrate progress. We grow from two experiences. One is the joy of winning, and the other is the pain of losing. Here's what that also means. Make losing painful. Put it on yourself. If you set something up, fooled around, didn't pull it off, put it on yourself. And get around people who will help in this area. Hey, don't join an easy crowd. Go where the expectations are high, where the pressure to perform is high. It's how we grow. I'm certain that part of the reason why people let goal-setting slide is because, 
it is a lot of work. As I said, you'll be constantly revising your lists of short-range and long-range goals, rearranging them, refining them, redesigning them, establishing different priorities, adding new goals, perhaps deleting others. It's interesting that so many people work hard on their jobs, but they don't work hard on their futures. They let that slide. Some people live such mediocre lives that at the end of the day, they don't know whether they're winning or losing. They just go through life with their fingers crossed. I know most people don't make definite plans, but don't let that be you. The guy says, well, you work where I work, but the time you get home, it's late. You've got to have a bite to eat, watch a little TV and get to bed. You can't sit up half of the night and plan, plan, plan. And this is the guy who's behind on his car note. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But I've discovered that you can be sincere and work hard all your life and wind up broke and embarrassed. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good planner, a good goal setter. You've heard the old saying, the people who fail to plan are planning to fail. It's true. So work on your plans. Put yourself in the top few percent who put this power to work for themselves. Writing your goals down also shows you are serious. And to do better, you must get serious. You don't have to be grim, but you do have to be serious. Hey, everybody hopes things will get better, but remember, the future does not get better by hope. It gets better by plan. And hope unaided by clear plans can finally become an illness. There's a Bible phrase that says, hope long delayed makes the heart sick. It's a sickness. I used to have the illness known as passive hope. It's bad. And there's one that is even worse, and that is called happy hope. That is really bad. The man is 50, and he's broke, and he's still smiling. That's bad. So get serious. Make plans. Put them on paper. My suggestion from experience. There's a phrase from the Bible that goes, without dreams and vision, we perish. How true. Humans have this unique ability to aspire, to dream, to go for something, to become something. Without that, life is not life. We must have dreams and never give up on our dreams. I'd like to share with you some further observations I've made on goal setting. Understand that your goals, whatever they are, are affecting you all day long. Handshake, your attitude, how you feel. Your goals affect how you look, how you dress, how you walk, how you talk, all day, every day. Your personality, conversation, activity, it's all affected by your goals. I asked a man one time, what are your goals for this month? And he said, if I could just scrape up enough money to pay these lousy bills. That was his goal. Hey, I'm not saying it isn't a goal. It is, but it's such a poor goal. It certainly isn't inspiring. You don't jump out of bed on Monday morning and say, oh boy, another chance to go out and scrape up the money to pay these lousy bills. The point is that goals should be fun. They should be big, challenging, rewarding. They should allow you to grow. Remember, too, that the major purpose of having a goal is not just to acquire the goal. The major reason for setting goals is to compel yourself to become the person it takes to achieve them. In other words, attaining the goal is of secondary importance. What's far more important is what you become in the pursuit of it. The greatest value in becoming a millionaire, for example, is not the million dollars. The greatest value is the skills, the knowledge, the discipline, and the leadership qualities you acquired in becoming a millionaire. It's the experience you acquired in planning, development, strategy. It's other qualities you acquired, such as courage, commitment, and willpower to attract a million dollars. You could lose everything you attained, but you could not lose the skills, knowledge, and experience you have obtained. Even better than having is being. Here's a most important question to spend some time answering. 
What kind of person will I have to become to get all I want? Write down a few thoughts on that. Write down some skills you'll have to develop, for example, and some of the things you're going to have to learn. Just spend a little time writing a few sentences on this. What kind of person will I have to become to get all I want? The answer to this will give you some personal development goals. Remember that income does not far exceed personal development. All of us have to do this kind of self-examination. I have to look at my own life and say, well, here's what I want, but am I willing to become what it takes to get what I want? If I'm too lazy, if I don't want to learn, read, study, and grow to become that kind of person, then I cannot attract what I want. Now, either I have to change my wants or I have to change myself. Here are a few more key points I'd like to share with you on goals and designing your future. First, if you don't right now feel as if you're equipped to get all you want, just remember, ability will grow to match your strong dreams. That's why the goal setting process we've discussed is so important. The more you work on this, the more ideas you will get on how you can change how you can grow. I am nowhere near the person I was when I met Mr. Shof 25 years ago. I'm not that person anymore. I've changed. There's nothing you can do about the past, but you can do a great deal about your future. You don't have to be the same person you were yesterday. You can make changes in your life, absolutely startling changes, in a fairly short period of time. You can make changes you can't even conceive of now. If you give yourself a chance, your abilities will grow. You have untapped talents and potential that you haven't even reached for yet. What has you turned on? What has you getting up early, hitting it hard all day and staying up late? What has you inspired? Next question, what's got you turned off? When I found the answers to those two questions, my life exploded into change. I finally found out what negative philosophy of life I had allowed to limit me and had me turned off. And I got that cured. I found a long enough list of reasons to turn me on. And once the lights went on for me at age 25, they have never gone out. I've fallen out of the sky a few times, but I've never lost that drive to do something unique with my life. Now there's another list of reasons for doing well called nitty-gritty, those hard little reasons that can really affect your life. Sometimes it doesn't take much of a goal to start you in a brand new life direction. I now carry a few hundred dollars in my money clip. It's only a few hundred dollars, but the story behind why I do it reveals one of those reasons that greatly affected me. Just before I met Mr. Schof, I heard a knock at my door one day when I opened it, there was a little girl selling Girl Scout cookies. And she gave me one of the finest sales presentations I've ever heard. A special deal, several flavors, and only $2. Back when you could get a lot for $2. And with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. And I wanted to. Big problem. I didn't have $2. And to this day, I can still clearly remember the pain and the embarrassment. I was a father, I had been to college, I was working, and I didn't have two dollars. Now, since I didn't want to tell her that, I did what I thought was next best. I lied to her. I said, hey, I've already bought lots of Girl Scout cookies. I've still got plenty stacked in the house. Now, that wasn't true, but it seemed to get me off the hook for the moment. She said, that's wonderful, sir. Thank you very much. And she went away. After she had left, I closed the door and that was the day I said, I don't want to live like this anymore. I've had it with being broke and I've had it with lying. I've had it with being embarrassed over not having any money in my pocket. I promised myself that day that this would never happen again. I picked a day and an amount, and I said, I'll never carry less. 
It was one of those reasons that still affects my life after all these years. So I now carry a few hundred dollars in my money clip. I do that for two reasons, I guess. One reason is the way it makes me feel. That special feeling of having plenty. Mr. Shove said to me, the first $500 you earn, put into your pocket, not in the bank. It feels much better in your pocket than it does in the bank. I've found that's true. But I also carry plenty in case I bump into another Girl Scout who's selling cookies. I'm ready. I remember walking out of the bank one day in Northern California where I lived at the time, and there were two little girls selling candy right outside the bank for some girls' organization. The first little girl walked up to me and said, Mr., would you like to buy some candy? I said, I probably would. What kind is it? She said, it's Almond Roca. I said, that's my favorite. She said, wonderful. I asked, how much is it? She said, it's only $2. I thought, it couldn't be still $2 after all these years. I couldn't help remembering the Girl Scout and the cookies. I said, how many boxes of that candy have you got? She said, I've got five. And the other little girl standing there, she was selling candy too. I asked, how many boxes do you have? She said, I've got four. I said, that's nine. I'll take them all. They said, really? I said, yes, I've got some friends, so I'll pass them around. They got so excited, put all this candy together. I reached into my pocket and gave them $18. Now, when I've got the candy and they've got the money, that first little girl looks up and says, Mr., you are really something. How about that? Can you imagine only spending $18? and having someone look at you in the face and say, you are really something. Now you know why I carry heavy. I'm not going to miss those chances anymore. It was a small goal, just a few hundred dollars, but it had a big effect on my life. I have a dear friend, Robert DePew. Bobby used to be a school teacher in Lindsay, California, the olive capital. After he taught school for several years, he became a little weary of teaching and decided to get into sales. One day, without telling anyone, he quit his teaching job and jumped into sales. When he did, his brother poked fun at him. His brother said, you're going to go right down the drain. You had a good teaching job. Now you're going to lose everything you have. You must be out of your mind. He put him down something fierce. Bobby said, the way my brother acted made me so angry. I decided to get rich. Today, Robert happens to be one of my millionaire friends. The attainment of wealth is not just a matter of intelligence. Mostly, it's a matter of inspiration. So if you have strong enough inspiration, a strong enough reason, large or small, it can have an incredible influence on the direction of your life. It's not the money that buys you a future, it's your skills that buy you a future. Money and no skills, and I'm telling you, you're still poor. Money and no ambition. Where are you? Money and no courage. You're broke. A little bit of money and a whole lot of courage. That's all we need. Because here's what all of us need for the 21st century. Business skills and life skills. Let me quickly give you now a list of the skills that changed my life forever. I knew how to milk cows, but didn't pay well. Here's the first skill I learned to change my life. Getting a customer, making a sale. If you share a unique product, talk about its merits. Persuade someone that it's the best they agree to buy. That's the simple art of sales. So we're not talking like high powered spacecraft. Technical skills here is simply sharing something you've discovered with someone else and doing it well enough to where they agree they would like to participate. Now here's what happened. When I learned sales, it multiplied my income by five. Now, it didn't take that much because I wasn't doing that well in farm country, but it did multiply my income by five. Sales, getting customers, laying that incredible foundation for an entrepreneurial career. So now I've got two skills, milking cows and making sales. Here's the next one I learned that changed me forever. And that's recruiting. 
Introducing the business opportunity to new people. Learning how to give a good invitation. Learning how to give two kinds of presentation, formal and informal. And the third part of recruiting, of course, is following up. Once you start a new life, now you gotta take care of it like a new mother would take care of her baby. You don't start a new life and abandon it. You start a new life and nourish it like a mother and protect it like a father. You got to be both mother and father to a new person. Nourishment ideas like a mother protection help defend your new life against the encroachment of outside voices that would try to talk them out of it. So you gotta be mother and father in this art of recruiting. We call it being a sponsor and being a sponsor is like being a bridge. Helping somebody from darkness to light, from skeptic to faith, from not knowing to knowing, from no confidence in themselves to starting to gain confidence. You're the bridge that helps people from the shadows to the sunlight. It's one of the most exciting positions to occupy in all of network marketing industry is the bridge. Helping people crossing the bridge out from discouragement into recognition being this bridge, that's what the recruiting magic is all about. You've got the answers, they've been looking for the answers, you've got the answers, and you help them cross this bridge. You see something in them before they can see it in themselves. You assure them that it's possible to be more than they are. Therefore, they can earn more than they've got, have more than they possess. This is one of the great arts in the world. And here's what's exciting about this art. It pays big money because now you operate a unique philosophy taught first in the Bible. John Kennedy taught it in his inaugural speech. Zig Ziglar's got one of the best ways to put it, and that's the secret to wealth. The secret to wealth and fortune first taught in the Bible. Because the question was asked, how can we achieve greatness? Great wealth, great power, great influence, great recognition, great self-esteem. How can we achieve greatness? The master teacher was asked, and here was his formula for achieving personal greatness. He said, find a way to serve the many for service to many leads to greatness for those that are interested. Some people aren't interested, but for those that are service to many leads to greatness, someone says, well, best I can do is just take care of myself, which is okay, but it doesn't lead to greatness. Sometimes I got enough bills on my own. I can't worry about someone else's bills. That's okay, but it doesn't lead to greatness. Greatness is helping people pay their bills. You forget about yours, because if you help enough people pay theirs, yours disappear. Help people with problems, your problems disappear. The key to greatness the master teacher taught is finding a way. Now, a lot of people would like to serve many people, but they don't have a way. And what's exciting about you and your business is, you've now got the way, whether you use it or not. It's up to you. Whether you cash it in or not is up to you. Whether you make a fortune or just a little, that's all up to you. Each person's ambition, it's called the same marketing the same product. These products are the same for everybody here. The marketing system is the same. The difference is each person's philosophy and each person's individual ambition. But whatever your ambitions are now, you've got the ways and means, and here's what you've got. The ways and means to do. Serve as many people as you would like. Now here's what's exciting about recruiting. With what you're involved in here, you can directly and indirectly affect the lives of dozens of people. Some of you are going to directly and indirectly affect the lives of hundreds of people. And some of you, if you wish, can directly and indirectly affect the lives of thousands of people. And the pay is accordingly. If you affect a few, you earn net pay. If you affect the many, you earn net pay. But the secret is found in the Bible. Service to many leads to greatness. Now, John Kennedy said it in his inaugural speech. Here's what he said. Don't ask. Don't we wish that was the current political philosophy? Where is John Kennedy and his philosophy? John Kennedy said, don't ask. That's important if you understand philosophy. He said, don't ask what the people can do for you. Don't ask what the country can do for you. Don't ask what the government can do for you. That's not how you get rich. That's not how you have high self-esteem. That's not how you get trophies to put on the mantle above the fireplace, asking what the people can do for you. Don't ask, he said, what the people can do for you, but ask what could I do for my country? And the country means the people. What could I do for the people? I want trophies. 
I want recognition. I want high self-esteem. I would even like, like a chance to make a fortune. John Kennedy says it's easy. Don't ask what the people can do for you, but ask what could I do for the people? Could I directly and indirectly serve many in my country? Now Zig probably said it. Zig says money isn't everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. Zig, you're right, Zig says. My dentist told me. Zig only floss the teeth you want to keep, you know, forget the rest. But here Zig is famous for this. Now this is one of Zig's philosophies, and it goes right along with the other two, the Bible and John Kennedy. Here's what Zig says. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want now, wanting everything you want. We call that self-interest. But it's, it's, it's okay to have self-interest if you do it in a positive way. By helping enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Now, you can accomplish all that by learning this next skill called recruiting. And I learned it and it made me fortunes. So now I've got three skills. Milking cows, making sales, and recruiting. Here's the next skill I learned that paid big money organizing. Once you got a few, get them to work together. See, and that's magic. Getting people to work together is magic. Now, yes, it's challenging, like having some, you know, several members of your family, getting them to work together. It's challenging, but it's magic. Getting husband and wife to work together is challenging, but it's magic when it happens. But everything magic is challenging. You just gotta jot that down. Everything magic is challenging. But once you figure out the challenge and go for it, then the magic... Let me tell you how magic, how magical people working together is. Let me quote the Bible again. It says, if two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing is impossible. Just try that on for your mental size. If two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing's impossible. Everybody's looking for a challenge. Here's what I teach, especially the kids. Here's the best challenge in the world. Let's go do it. Not you. Go do it. Let's go do it. If two or three of us decide on a common purpose to do it, nothing's impossible. Incredible. Working together, organizing now, when everybody's an independent now, it's a little more challenging. Like having kids. They've each got their own opinions. They've each got their own ambitions and desires. It, it's challenging. You've got a variety. But that's what makes life the variety, and it is in your business. It is challenging getting people to work together. It's like herding cats. You know, sheep are easy. Sheep are easy, but you got to try cats. Herding cats. But if you can possibly get it done, the power is so immense when you get people to work together. Here's one of the powers of working together. Shared testimonials. If I've got somebody new and you're there and I'm there, I give them my testimonial. You give your testimonial? Maybe. What tips the scales in getting me a new person is not my testimonial, but my partner's testimonial. Somebody I'm working with, their testimonial got them. Shared testimonials are so powerful. That's why getting working together is okay is powerful. Now working by yourself is okay. All this stuff is okay. Everybody needs to know though, where are the advantages? And these are some of the advantages I learned to organize paid big money. Here's what I next learned to do. Promote promotion now pays staggering money. Now the company comes up with what we call major promotions. Here's what you've got to come up with the smaller promotions. The company comes up with major recognition. You've got to come up with small recognition for your people around you. The top five. The company's got top five. You've got your own top five in maybe two or three categories. Top five, top five, top five, and those little recognitions. To reach certain levels in the company, you have to take major steps. But for you, recognition. Let them take small steps. Here's one of the secrets of your kind of business rewarding people for small steps of progress. Important rewarding people. Sometimes it's just recognition, handshake, pat on the back. Mary, you're doing the fabulous job and you figure out what those recognitions are. Small steps of progress. Guess what promotion pays if you learn it well? Big money. Getting people to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do by themselves. People will do some unique things by themselves. But if you can figure out a way to say, Mary, if you do this and this, she says, well, I'll go for it. 
Now, she, she wouldn't have thought of that on her own. Here's what works. Magic. It's better than money. Money is a bit unimportant. Here's what's important. Ingenuity. The best place to wake up your ingenuity is what you're doing right now. Representing a unique product and getting customers, recruiting distributors and promoting and all this stuff. Ingenuity. Figuring out a way. If it doesn't work this way, we'll work another way. I used my ingenuity made a fortune. I learned promotion and it paid big money. Here's next. I learned communication, how to conduct a meeting. I learned identification, logic and reason. Attack and confess solution. Simple deals on communication wasn't easy for me at first. I stood up to give my first presentation. My mind sat back down. Right. Y'all been through that open my mouth. Nothing came out for a while. But here's what I did. I did it again. Just jot that phrase down. I did it again. That's the secret to how I got here 3,540 years later. It's how I got here. I did it once. It was uncomfortable. That first presentation was so lousy. If I hadn't have been doing it, I'd have gone home. It was not that good. But here's the secret to how I got here. I did it again. And then I did it again. And then I did it again. And I did it again. I remember when I first decided to be a little more animated, right? And walk out, away from the podium. Right, get out from just behind the podium. So I got out there and then I thought, how do you get back? Why? Remember those times? Doing something for the first time. So learn communication. How to affect other people with words. That's the greatest arts in the world. To learn how to affect other people with words. Key phrase. Don't be lazy in language. If you learn to use the gift of your own language wisely, it can make you a fortune and build an incredible life. Here's three other things I learned. One is to train. Training people how the business works. And then I've used another word called teach, train and teach. And only to say this, training people how the business works. Teaching is how life works. Because here's what all of us need for the 21st century. Business skills and life skills. The life skills are leadership skills. The life skills are learning how to set goals. Now here's the ultimate skill to learn that can transform your life and the life of whoever will listen. The ability to inspire, inspire means help people to look up a little higher than where they are and wish they could get there and inspire them that it's possible. Here's how we inspire by our own testimonial. If I can do it, you can do it. Here's how else we inspire by others. Testimonial. If they can do it, Mary, you can do getting people to see themselves better than they are. Getting people to see themselves richer than they are. Getting people to see themselves more capable next year than they are this year. Getting to see themselves in the future to help both your kids and your people. Here's what you must learn to do. Number one, help people to see themselves as they are. If people have made mistakes, they got to know it. You can't go on making mistakes and hope to achieve. Mistakes have to be corrected, and you've got to do it with your children. Help them to see themselves as they are. If they've messed up, here's what you've got to say. You've messed up. But here's what's important as a parent. Don't leave them in the mess. Some parents, you know, tell their kids they've messed up, and then they leave them in the mess. They don't paint a better picture. Here's what you could become with just a couple of more changes rather than this. Here's what you could be. So we must help our children see themselves as they are. But here's the greatest gift to help our children see themselves better than they are. To transport them not only past, to see their mistakes, but transport them to the future. To see their opportunity, to see the person they can become. My mentor had that greatest gift to help me, to see myself better than I was. At first it was difficult to see. Then I started to believe. And that's how I got here today, he said. One of these days, mister. Oh, and you'll walk into a room full of people and you will hear some of them say, that's him. That's the famous man. I, I said, well, that could never happen to me. He said, trust me, if you keep working hard on the disciplines like you're doing right now, that'll happen. You'll walk into a room full of people and you'll hear one say, that's him. That's the famous man. He saw it and he tried to get me to see it. And now finally it's happened. I think when I walked in here today, I think I heard someone say, that's him. That's the famous van. And if it can happen for me, it can happen for you. 
Just master these skills to inspire. Here's what else I, I learned the skills of building an organization. Learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. You must be like life itself. Respond to deserve, not to need. It doesn't say if you need, you will have a harvest. It doesn't say if you need a harvest, you'll have a harvest. It's not what it says. It says if you plant, chances are good, you'll have a harvest. If you plant, you will reap. Not if you need, you will reap. So we must be like life itself. Respond to the people who deserve it by planning, by taking the first step. Even God himself says, if you move toward me, I'll move. That's the condition. You move toward me, I'll move toward you, says the Almighty. Now he could also say, you don't move, I don't move, you say. Well, that's arbitrary. Well, when you're gods, you can set it up that way. Now learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. Now here's what's the next step. Teach people how to deserve your time. Teach people how to deserve your attention. Teach people how to deserve a phone call. Say, Mary, you just take this one step and I take two steps. You take two steps, I take five steps. You don't step, I don't. But this isn't hard now. You step, I step. You respond, I respond. You try, I try. You make a call, I back you up, right? Learn to teach people how to deserve your time and your attention. Next, I learned to work by group more than in. Here's why. 80 out of the people do 20 of the business. So 20 of the people you can work with individual. 80 you have to work with by group. But group is very powerful, less confrontational. Then here's what's important for all of you to learn. You can help 1,000, but you can't carry three on your back. You can help 1,000, but you can't carry three on your back. And I'm sure all of you have already gotten that experience. Even though you've been here a short time, some people will try to get on your back. That's where we got that expression. Get off. That's where we got that. A guy discovered somebody on his back and said, what I can't carry, you get. Now, if you're like some I see here, you know, six foot four and you weigh 300 LBs, you might carry one. And if, if you were really big enough, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or something, you might carry two. But you can't carry three. When babies are born, they were not designed just to be carried. Babies were not born to be carried all their life. Someday you got to try your legs. Someday you got to try your wings. Someday you got to try. Even if you fall down, you got to try. Because you can't just crawl around all your life. You can't be carried all your life. So as quickly as possible, you can help 1,000, but you can't carry three. Next, don't expect the pear tree to bear apples. I used to try to change everything. You can hang apples on a pear tree. I'm telling you, it won't help. You can put up a sign. This is an apple tree. Sure enough, come the season peers. Here's what I learned. You cannot change people, but they can change themselves. You cannot change people, but they can change themselves. Incredible capital in your business isn't what matters, okay? It's not the money that buys you a future. It's your skills that buy you a future. Money and no skills. And I'm telling you, you're still poor money and no ambition. Where are your money and no courage? You're broke? A little bit of money and a whole lot of courage. That's all we need. I'm looking for people and I'm recruiting back in those days and the money didn't matter. What mattered to me was somebody's willingness, somebody's ingenuity, somebody's willingness to try, right? If they had a dollar to invest, that was plenty for me. A dollar and some ambition. And I can show you how to get rich and it'll be one of the classic stories of the company. I go to recruit somebody. They say, I don't have any money. See, I've been looking for you for six months. Let me show you how to do it without any money. Because here's the rules of capitalism. Got this down. You can either buy and sell, or if you're in certain circumstances, you can sell and buy. If you've got ambition. Now, if you haven't got ambition, we can't cure that. And money won't cure lack of ambition. But if you've got a dollar and some ambition, I'll show you how to get rich. And even if you don't have a dollar, I'll show you how to get rich because you can sell and buy. Somebody says, as soon as the product arrives, I'll sell it. Then you don't understand. You don't understand the magic of fortune. If you say, I have to wait till it gets here to sell it, and you probably don't understand the value of your own story. Once I understood that, I knew I was going to be wealthy. That's why right in the beginning, I started giving big tips. I knew I was going to be wealthy. Say, wow. This guy tips like a rich man. 
said, that's right. He tips like a rich man. Even in the beginning, I tipped like a rich man because I knew I was going to be rich man. What five things have you already accomplished that you're proud of? That you've already accomplished that you're proud of? Next question. What do you want in the next 10 years? I want you to make a list of at least 50 items. Now, this is not what you think you can get. This is what you want. If everything fell into place and you could have anything you wanted in the next 10 years, what would that list be? Not something you think you can earn, not something you think you can buy, not something you think you can, you know, finally be so successful you can get. This is what would really do it for you the next 10 years. I want you to make this list. And here's the deal now. I want you to put each item one under the other, not side by side, but one under the other and make a lo as long a list as you possibly can in the time I'm going to give you. One underneath the other, because we're going to do some things with this list when you finish, okay? Just start writing now, as fast as you can, abbreviate where you can, make a longer list. If something's private, put it in code so nobody could figure it out, if they got a hold of this list. One underneath the other, as fast as you can write. Just let your dreams, okay, run free here. Not what you think you can get, but what you want. If everything fell into place and you could have whatever you wanted the next 10 years, what would that be? Little things, major things, insignificant things doesn't matter just make the list places you want to visit i've been to a lot of countries but i got a long list of countries i haven't been to yet last year i checked cyprus off my list what countries haven't you been to that you'd like to visit the next 10 years cities you'd like to visit i've never been to venice i've been around the world and all over italy and i've never been to venice so it's on my list i haven't been to egypt I haven't been to saudi arabia you'd think i've been everywhere you know 39 years, not yet. What experiences would you like to have in the next 10 years? Parachute out of an airplane, star in a movie, play in a rock and roll band, win a gold medal in the Olympics, start a new family, try a new sport. What do you want for your children? That's a whole list in itself. Education, places you want to take them. What new skill would you like to learn over the next 10 years? When I started learning new skills at age 25, it changed my life. I learned sales, multiplied my income by five first year. I learned how to find good people, recruiting, multiplied my income some more. I learned how to organize, learned how to promote rewarding people for small steps of progress. I became so good at that, my income went crazy. Maybe you'd like to give seminars, write some books. The next 10 years, some things right away, within the next year, some on out there, benevolence goals. Maybe you've got a long list of projects you'd like to support. Now, this is not what you think you can do. This is what you'd really like to do. Mark Hughes had a passion for helping kids that had drug problems. One year, he gave eight million. Eight million dollars. When I first met him, he couldn't give 800. Finally, he could give eight million. Andrew Carnegie said, I'm going to spend the first half of my life accumulating money, and I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. That's big time. In the first half of his life, he accumulated $400 million, which back then was a lot of money. Guess what he did the last half of his life? He gave it all away. So keep your list going. What's got you turned on? Maybe you've been turned off until you got here this weekend. I want you to start working on turning your lights on for accomplishments. You can't believe what you can accomplish if you'll just work hard on this list now. You know, it's amazing how adults have, you know, a problem with this, right? Let's see. And kids don't have any problem. They'd be asking for extra sheets of paper by now. I mean, you know, kids say, you mean anything I could, anything I want the next 10 years? Yes, write it all down. They would go like crazy. A cabin in the mountains, a upstairs maid, a, a cook, a chauffeur. How about your investments, properties? One of my goals was someday to be financially independent. We're going to talk about that a little later. My father convinced me years and years ago that someday I should be debt free. Oh, no one anything. My mother and father practiced that. When I inherited the estate, all the lands and the house and the buildings and the things and the cars and everything, guess how much was owing when I inherited it all? Zero. Not one penny everything free it is a glorious feeling 
for no one to have a claim on anything you got. Maybe you want to be in the top 10 in wealth. Is Bill Gates still number one? The top 10 or the top 20? I mean, you know, whatever. Maybe you're working on a new invention. Congratulations, someday, who knows? Make a list of your health goals. Got to have a good physical support system over the next 10 years. How healthy do you want to be? Eliminate some illnesses, eliminate some weaknesses. Get strong for competition in the 21st century. One of my goals was to have a residence in each season, for each season. Finally, check that off my list. So I could spend winter here and summer here, autumn here, and spring here. Residence for each season. An apartment in Manhattan, a ranch in Brazil. What would really do it for you the next 10 years? Some goals for your career, your business. I put a little revenge on my first list. Some of the people that said I couldn't do well, they were on that first list. Couldn't wait to get my new car, drive it up on their lawn and say, oh, pardon me, here's the money to have it fixed. I mean, I, I had some stuff on my list, something that would give you incredible satisfaction. Old Testament, God says, vengeance is mine, all mine. No wonder he wants it all. It feels so good. If I was God, I'd want it all. What would really do it for you? Some scores to settle, gently but deliberately. My Japanese friend, Toro Ikeda, San Jose, California, put on his first list, a Caucasian gardener. I thought, hey, that's good, Toro. What would do it for you? A hobby you'd like to start, collecting. New car, become a race driver. I got this neat little motorhome, right? Put the dirt bike on the back, away I go. I'm now putting a fax machine in my motorhome so I can be a little more in touch even when I'm gone. Here's my new mode for the future, in touch and out of reach. That's the new deal. Say, so yes, you can, right? You can contact him, but you can't find him for a while, he's gone. So, you know, what is your goal for the future? To get away, something that would really serve you well in terms of refreshing, change of pace, skills you want to help teach your children. I taught my girls how to swim, how to dive. Such great satisfaction when they used to say, watch me, daddy, watch me. Look how good I am. You taught me, watch me. Got a good phrase for you. This is a good one to put in here. All life seems to wish to reward its benefactor. All life wishes to reward its benefactor. If you take especially good care of the flowers, they will bloom especially bright for you. If you teach your children, they will want to show off for you. Daddy, look how good I am. All life takes delight in rewarding its benefactor. What classes would you like to teach? My friend, Lydia Colon, who 21 year, 20 years ago invested a dollar, now she's a millionaire. One of her specialties is helping young parents do a little marriage counseling, right? Some of those early years, right? Two, three, four, five years, those early years are pretty tough to get through. What specialty would you like to learn? Make a contribution to society make a contribution to your community. Does most everybody have a list of 50 now? Okay, that's almost everybody. Okay, now put a little star there, right, that says you can continue this list. This doesn't mean this is all you get. Say, no, this is just to get you started because I promise you when you get back home, you'll think of 50 more and 50 more and 50 more that you couldn't think of while you were here and, and this list can grow and grow and grow. Now, here's what this also means. If you have a lot more time than we have today, you can take plenty of time to just have people make as long a list as, you know, possible. Okay, now we're gonna do some things with this list. Here's the next exercise. I want you to look at each item on this list you've made and give each item a number. The number being a one, three, five, or 10. And this is why. I want you to look at an item and say, I think that would take about one year. Another item you say, I think that would take about three years. Another item, I think that would take five. And another item, Looks like that's going to take 10. Give each item now a number of what you think it might take to achieve that goal. A 1, a 3, a 5, or a 10. Just somewhere close. Doesn't have to be exact. That's about a 1. That's about a 3-year goal. That's about a 5-year goal. That's about a 10-year goal. If it's less than one year, just make it a year. If it's more than 10, just make it 10. 10 plus. So running a marathon. Now, as soon as you've given each item a number, I want you to now go through and count them. How many 1s? How many 3s? How many 5s? How many 10s? and then just make a little list of those numbers. How many ones, threes, fives, tens? This is gonna be interesting. How many of you had no 10-year goals? Okay, quite a few, right? Isn't that 
interesting. Here's what that means. You're not thinking out that far. You're thinking more short term than long term. If someone had zero, someone had 14, that's a lot of difference in thinking long range. So that's all that's for is just to help you to think more long range. Okay. Now make these notes. When you've accomplished some goals, you need some more to accomplish. Next, it's very important when you reach a goal that's significant or important to you to celebrate. So just jot that down. Celebrate a significant accomplishment. Or it doesn't have to be that significant. If it's important to you, you know, it doesn't have to be world changing or life changing. If it's just a goal that's really important to you, you finally reached it celebrate now hopefully on your list of goals you had some family goals and if the family together finally reaches a goal jot this down celebrate with the family and if you're checking it off let each member of the family put their check mark on this goal because the whole family worked on this one now here's what this will do it will help each member of your family to make a longer list of goals wow if we can accomplish this think of what else we could do the same is true of you individually when you accomplish something, check it off, celebrate. It'll help you to grab your lists wherever it is and say, hey, if I can get here, I can double that original list. So celebration creates excitement to, to develop a longer list. You also need goals ongoing. When the early astronauts went to the moon, uh, some of them, when they came back from the moon, had psychological problems. Some of them drank too much, got into other difficulties. And one of the reasons is, where do you go now that you've been to the moon? So here's what they did later. They made sure that the astronauts later who came back from the moon had plenty of projects to keep them busy after they had been to the moon. And the same is true of you and me. Goals, after you've reached them, another list. After you've reached those, another list. My father lived to be 93. You can't imagine the goals he had. One of his goals when he was 92 was to get his driver's license renewed. Guess what he got it renewed for? four years. At age 92, he got his driver's license renewed for four years. Now, he didn't live long enough to, if he'd have thought about it more, I think he would have lived two or three more years just to make sure he filled all that out. Unbelievable. So, goals to replace goals that you've achieved on and on the rest of your life. Because the philosophy we discussed yesterday was what? How far should you go? far as you can. How many books should you read? As many as you can. How many friends should you make? As many as you can. How much should you earn? As much as you can. That's it. What should you try to be? All you possibly can. And that's the purpose of this exercise is just to stretch you, get you to think, get you to wonder, get you to ponder. I wonder what might be possible. If I could get everything I wanted, what would that be? Now here's the next exercise. Okay, jot down the question. On your list of one year goals, which are the four most important? So now I want you to go back over your one-year goals and pick out the four most important. You know, if you've only got four now, this is an easy exercise. So, but you might add some more to your one-year list if you haven't got enough. And then pick out the four most important. This is what turned me on at age 25. Goals for accomplishment and personal progress. Once the fires were lit for me, I'm telling you, they have never gone out. Since I was 25 years old, no one has ever said to me, when are you going to get going? When are you going to get off the couch? When are you going to get off the... I've never heard that since I was 25 and got all this taken care of. Here's what I've heard since I was 25. When are you going to slow down? You can't visit that many countries. You're going to have a heart attack and die. By the way, you might stop and, and jot these notes down. Here's two, here's two excellent questions to jot down. And this is for mature people now because these are kind of tough questions, especially one. Here's the first question. What's got you turned on? That's a good list to make. Here's what's got me turned on. Here's what's got me up early, staying up late, maximizing my abilities all day long. Here's the list of what's got me turned on. Now here's the next question. What's got you turned off? How come you don't have the zest and the vitality and the appetite for daily accomplishment? I started making a list of the things that had me turned off. And once I got that settled and then started making a list of what had me turned on and what would turn me on in the future, I'm telling you, my life has never been the same. It was like a revolution, a personal revolution, a 180 degree turn. I can't say it strong enough. It's easy to get lazy in designing the day and designing the year and designing the future and designing what you want to accomplish and just cross your fingers and hope it'll all work out that the favorable winds will blow it all your way. I'm telling you, it's not gonna happen. So this is the part of the exercise, is just, you know, buckling down, making this list. And you got to continue this long after we've, you know, turned out the lights and we've all gone home. Keep this up. And one of the best ways to keep it up, I've already covered yesterday is what? 
teach it. The key is to teach it. Jan was right. You don't need recognition. Just go give everybody you can think of that deserves it recognition. And your own self-satisfaction is recognition enough. If they never put a crown on your head, who cares? Okay, the four most important one-year goals. Have you got those identified? Okay, now here's the next exercise. This will take now just a little bit of time. And the question is why? Why are those four goals important to you? Because the why is very important, and I'm going to give you some notes on that a little bit later. So just start a little paragraph, why those four goals are important to you. And then we'll put a little star there that says continue this later. This is a good question to ask kids. Kids said, here's what I'd like to have, and you say, why is that? And if they can start describing the why. So now make these notes. Put a little star there now, and that star means that, you know, you can add to it later. So make these notes now. Here's the first one. When the why gets stronger, the how gets easier. When the why gets big, powerful, strong, how seems to be so much easier. Without a strong enough why, the how seems to be too difficult almost to accomplish. Say, how do you manage your time? Hey, if you had strong and powerful enough goals, you'd figure out how to manage your time. You'd get a book on the subject. You know, you'd do something to manage your time if it was worth it. If it's not worth it, you know, why would you bother studying the art of managing your time if it really doesn't matter? But if it really mattered in the accomplishment of your goals and why you wish to accomplish them, see, you can do anything. You can get up any hour, read any book, take any class, make any change, develop any skill, do any discipline. I mean, you can do it all. When this how and the why, or when the why starts to grow, the how gets simple. Excellent question to ask children. Why? What for? Little note. Maybe one of your goals was to have a million dollar home on the hill overlooking Snake River Valley. That'd be a good goal. A million dollar home. Here's the next question. What for? What for? I mean, a house is a house is a house with bricks and wood and walls and roof. Key, yes, million dollar home. That'd be wonderful. But what for? So now jot this down. Purpose is stronger than object. The object would be the house, and that'll pull. That's a worthy goal to go for, the object of the house. But here's a stronger goal, the purpose for the million-dollar home. You say, well, it'll be the centerpiece of all the family's activity with all kinds of unique people coming and going and the influence and things will be happening in this place. See, now we're getting somewhere. So if you got that line, it's one of my best for the whole day. Purpose is stronger than object. It's okay to have plenty of objects to go for on your goal list. But always keep asking yourself the question, and sometimes it's good to just write it out. Here's why I want this money. Here's why I want this place. Here's why. And you start developing those reasons. And I'm telling you now, this starts to become incredibly powerful. Now here's some more notes. Some of your goals should be personal development. The person you wish to become. Develop skills that make you attractive to the marketplace. Develop the temperament and the attitude that makes you attractive to the business world. The attitude and the temperament that makes you a splendid father, studying the art. Because here's what's important. It's not what you get that makes you valuable. It's what you become that makes you valuable. I keep saying this year after year for the last 39 years public. It's the person you become. The idea of becoming an attractive person, a skillful person, a good friend, a good colleague, a good partner, a good member of the round table, a contributor. See, that's the key, the person you become. Okay, now here's the next exercise. Isn't this good stuff? I mean, this I'm telling you, this stuff changed my life, altered the course of my life, from milk and cows to sitting on this stool. Incredible, what a journey. And part of the explosive stimulation started when I met Earl Schoff, and he asked me, have you got a list of goals? And I said, no. And he said, then I can guess your bank balance. I thought, whoa. I immediately started studying the art, and the art and the accomplishments of it helped to change my life. Now, here's the next exercise. I want you to look now at the whole list that you've written and the exercises we've done, now I want you to answer this question. What kind of person must I become to achieve all I want? And I'll give you time to write that down now. What kind of person must I become to achieve all I want? Now we've got two things working. What you become helps you to achieve, and what you achieve helps you to become. And the more you become, the more you can achieve, and the more you achieve, the more you can become. Who knows which affects the other the most? 
So now just write this exercise. Start with a few sentences. We won't have time for you to, you know, take a lot of time, but just start with a few sentences. Your concept of the person you think you must become to achieve what you want. This is time for a little truth. Maybe you need to become much wiser than you are at the moment. You need to become stronger. You need to have better health. Maybe you need a little coaching to really become the person I want to become. I'm going to have to have some coaching, physical coaching, spiritual coaching, developing skills coaching. To be the influence you want to be, you got to build an incredible reputation. What kind of person must I be to attract all that I want in my life and the people that I want and the opportunities that I want? When you knock on the door and opportunity opens, you must stand there as a very attractive person or you may not be invited. One of the most mysterious and unique phrases that Jesus ever used. Here's what he said. I stand at the door and knock. And if you open the door, would you probably invite him in? This extraordinary person. You say, wow, yeah. And he said, if you invite me, I'll come in, I'll sit down, talk things over. For you to be that kind of attractive person, that if you knocked on the door of opportunity and it opened and you stood there, would you be the kind of person that opportunity would say, come right in and sit down and let's talk about the future? What kind of person? Okay. Now put a little star there. And what the star means, right, is to finish this exercise later. Now, if you're working, right, in a workshop where you've got plenty of time, plenty of time, you just, you know, take a little more time for some of these exercises. Make these notes. The key is to put everything on your list. Now, the key is to take it out of your head and put it on paper. You know, you can dream about what you want, but when you start committing it to paper, now it more formalizes. Information now starts to make a composite of an idea. And ideas can turn into hotels, ideas can turn into enterprises, ideas can turn into a fabulous career. We need the information, we need the stimulation. But then you'll learn now later to start putting everything on your list. Now, jot this down. It's very important if something's not that important to you to take it off your list. You don't have to accomplish this whole list. But if you had 100 items on your list and you accomplished 80, who cares about the other 20? If you got the biggest share of what you went for, wouldn't that be enough? And the answer is probably yes, it'd be overwhelming. So you can rearrange this list, you can change it, you can tear it up and start over. You can say, oh, you know, last year I thought this was so important. That, that's not important to me anymore. The things I've learned in the last 12 months, I've changed my whole goal list. I thought this was so it. Okay, now here's the next note and we're wrapping it up now. Here it is. There's two great words of antiquity everybody should learn. Here they are, one's positive and one's negative. And we studied a bit about that yesterday. Positive, negative. Here's the positive word from antiquity. Behold, that's the positive word. Behold the possibilities, behold the opportunity, behold the future and give it design. Behold and look at the chances you've got. Behold, spring has come. Behold, the day has arrived and the sun is shining and the shadows are fleeing away. Behold, the next person you can meet might be your friend for life. Behold, the next person might be a colleague forever. Behold, that's the positive word, behold. Now, here's the negative word, beware. Now I want to give you a sentence to jot down that's very valuable for this weekend session. Here's what it is. Beware of what you become in pursuit of what you want. Beware. All of our lives, we have to deal with behold and beware. When a kid goes to school, it's behold the opportunity and beware the dangers, behold and beware. So beware of what you become, pursuing what you want. Some things I went for in the very beginning cost me too much. I got so obsessed with some things that I found out later the price was too big to pay. If I would have known better, I never would have paid. But sometimes we learn when. So don't become so obsessed with something that you lose your sense of reason or it costs you your friends. Don't be so obsessed with something that you compromise your virtues and your values. The story says Judas got the money. You say, well, that's a success story. No, no. It's true, 30 pieces of silver was a sizable sum of money, but it was not a success story. His name was Judas. Doesn't that ring a bell? It makes all the difference in the world. Judas got the money. Here's something interesting about the story of Judas. After he got the money, he was unhappy. Someone says, well, if you had a fortune in your hand, would you, why would you be unhappy? And here's the key. He was not unhappy with the money. He was unhappy with himself. 
Here's a key phrase. The greatest source of unhappiness is self-unhappiness. It's not from outside the things that make us unhappy. The greatest devastating unhappiness is to be unhappy with yourself. Now, a mild form of unhappiness is constructive. The desperate form of unhappiness is destructive. It's like worry. We should all worry a little, but not let it destroy our lives. If you're in New York about to step off the curb in downtown Manhattan and the yellow taxi's coming, best you worry enough to get your feet back up on the curb lest you get yourself wiped out. So it's called caution, but not undue caution. It's called fear and worry, but not the worry that kills you, not the worry that destroys you. It's like hate. You know, you don't need to hate your job. Save your hate for the important things like evil, like the weeds that attack your garden, like the diabolical ideas that try to entice your children. You don't need to hate everything. I hate this, I hate that. That's the misuse of your hate. Save it for the things we really must hate. But this is so important now to beware. Judas was so unhappy, he tried to take the money back. They said, heck with you, we got what we wanted, you got what you wanted out. They threw him out with his money. Now he becomes so desperate, he goes out and hangs himself for what he did. He became a traitor. So that's the caution now. If Judas could speak back to us in any kind of clear language, here's what he might say. Beware of what you become in pursuit of what you want. Don't sell out, it's not worth it. And now here's the last note. If you'll start this glorious journey of being meticulous, deliberate, and hardworking about setting your goals for the day, setting your goals for the month and the year, setting your goals for your family and yourself and your business and your colleagues. Start thinking forward. Here's what you will become. A major contributor, not only to yourself, but a major contributor to others. And that's exactly what you want. Here's another little subject before we quit this now. I just mentioned it a little earlier before we started this class. Jot this down on personal development. This is especially for married people that have children. If you're married and you have children, I got some great advice for you. Here's the best I can give you. I'm not a counselor, but this is great stuff. Here's number one. If the parents are okay, the kids are okay. Chances are high, odds are high. If the parents are okay, the kids are okay. Your own self-development is the best contribution you can give to your children. Not self-sacrifice, self-development and contribution. Self-sacrifice usually earns contempt. Self-development and self-investment earns respect. I used to use the old phrase, I'll take care of you, you take care of me. I found out how short-ended that was. I changed it and Bob Cummings, the old movie star, helped me to change it. Here it is, I'll take care of me for you if you'll take care of you for me. The best contribution I can make to you if you're my friend is my personal development. What if I become 10 times wiser, 10 times stronger, 10 times better, 10 times more unique? Think of what that will do for our friendship. If the parents multiply their own personal value by two, by three, by five, by 10, what would that do for their children? Wow. If the parents are happy, I'm telling you the kids will be happy. If the parents engage in unique lifestyle, don't miss anything. Drink deep of the cup of whatever's available. I'm telling you, if the parents are okay, the kids are probably going to be okay. Wow. If you're on an airplane, the stewardess says, if we run out of oxygen, these masks are going to drop down. And then she says, make sure you take care of your children first. No. Would you underline no? Would you underline no, no? Have you got that? You should take care of your children first. No. It says put your mask on first. You take care of yourself first. Then you assist your children. And I just mentioned that would be a, a good title of a book, wouldn't it? For parents, put your mask on first. <laughs> Isn't this good information? The best contribution to your company is your self-development. The best contribution to your husband or your wife is your personal development. To become all you can become, as wise as you can, and as kind as you can, and as unique as you can, that's the best contribution. Not self-sacrifice, self-development and self-investment. Maybe that little talk might be worth the price of the weekend or the time and the money. It was helpful for me. Here's one more on that. With your family or whatever decisions you have to make, if you've made the decision, best decision you can, but it's going to cause some pain, here's what you must learn to do. Accept the pain, but not the guilt. There's part of our head sometimes that tries to make us feel guilty. 
if we've made a decision that's been painful, not necessarily, not just for us, but maybe even for other people. But it had to be made. So here's the key to accept the pain, but not the guilt. Because it's not pain that destroys you. Isn't that goal setting session fantastic? I mean, this is life changing stuff. Success is the steady progress toward your own personal goals. What then is failure? Is failure working on a project that ended with poor results? No, of course not. Is failure launching a new product that failed miserably in the marketplace? No, of course not. Is failure doing the best you possibly can with your kids and having them disappoint you in a very personal way? No, of course not. There's no failure in pouring your heart and soul and energy into something that didn't work. Rather, failure is not trying at all. If success is the steady progress toward your own personal goals, then failure is no progress at all. None. Not even trying. Success and failure are always linked together. Success and failure are always linked to ambition. And let's remember, success is doing. Failure is not doing. It's that simple. Tom Peters, world-renowned author and management expert, said recently, there is only one way to be in serious trouble today, and that is not to be trying, not to be failing, not to be stretching yourself. Success is a doing. You've got to actually do it. Activity is high priority in the life process to try and get maximum benefit out of what we have available. Our resources, our skills, our knowledge, and our talents. Success is a doing that tries to get maximum benefit out of what we have available. Benjamin Disraeli, former Prime Minister of England, once said, Nothing can resist a human will that will stake even its existence on its purpose. I'll do it or die. What a powerful set of words. We've already talked about resolve. Doing it until, but here's what else resolve says. Resolve says I will. Two of the most powerful words in our language. The formula for disaster. Could, should, don't. Here's the formula for fortune. Could, should, will, could, should, will. I will, I should, I can, and I will. Two of the most powerful words in the language. I will. The man says, I will climb the mountain. They say it's too high. It's too difficult. It's too rocky. It's never been done before. The man says, hey, it's my mountain, I'll climb it. Pretty soon you'll see me waving from the top or dead aside because I'm not coming back until I've done it. It's powerful. There are several studies that show the greatest achievers aren't those who fail the least. No. The greatest achievers are those least frightened of failure. They're willing to take on the challenge without the guarantee of success, seeing the end, but not sure when it will be or where it will be. Although success and failure go hand in hand, many people have a problem with failure. They think it's a bad word, has a bad connotation. They don't see it as a stepping stone. They see it as an end result. Quite often, success requires failure, sometimes many failures. In every scientific discovery, there were dozens or hundreds of failures before one's success. Without failure, Opportunity cannot be created. Without failure, there can be no success. What is the measure of success? How do you know if you're successful, really successful? How do you know, especially when your success could be so vastly different from someone else's success? Here's how you measure results, making measurable progress in reasonable time. That's all life asks, making measurable progress in reasonable time. So you've got to be reasonable with time. Don't be unreasonable with time. Parents, don't be unreasonable with time. 
managers, brokers, business associates, have a little patience. You can't ask somebody every five minutes, how are you doing now? That's too soon. The guy says, I haven't left the building yet. Give me a break. So five minutes is too soon to ask. So five years is what? Too long and too late. So what is reasonable time to ask for results as a measure of progress? Here's number one. At the end of the day, you can't let more than a day go by without getting some things done. Some letters written having a conversation with your son or daughter. You can't postpone the important more than a day. When you work on the job, there are some things you've got to get done within a day. You've got to make some calls within a day. Your health disciplines, you've got to get those done within a day. You can't carry over. You can't say, well, I'll eat nine apples 10 days from now. No, it's an apple a day. Some things you've got to get done within a day. So at five minutes to midnight and you haven't gotten your apple in yet, munch away and get it done. Done a day. Here's what's next. A week. Some things you've got to get done within a week. Stuff on the job, calls made activities. A week is a good chunk of time. Can't let more than a week go by without taking a look and a measure to see how you're doing. John joins this little sales company. He's supposed to make 10 calls the first week just to get acquainted out there in the marketplace. Would it be legitimate to call John in on Friday and say, how many calls did you make? That's legitimate. It's legitimate time to ask for a measurable amount of progress. He's supposed to make 10 calls come Friday. How many calls did you make? John says, well, you say John will won't fit in my little box here. I just need a number. Now John starts with a story. You say, John, the reason I made this little box so small is so a story won't fit. I don't need a story. I just need a number. Now, here's one of the better phrases to take home. The numbers tell us the whole story on you personally. The numbers tell us the whole story. Success is a numbers game. There are three important questions to ask yourself in this area. Here's number one. How much money have you saved and invested during your career? Second question. In the last 90 days, how many books have you read to invest in the miracle of your mind? Give you ideas to ponder. Fashion your future with meticulous care. How many books have you read in the last 90 days? Third question. In the last six months, how many classes have you taken to improve your skills or to develop new skills for your future and your family? How many classes in the last six months? I'm telling you, numbers tell us everything. Success is a numbers game. You've got to make progress. You've got to make progress in reasonable time. You've got to take a look at the numbers and see how you're doing. It's the name of the game. How often should you weigh the new baby? Well, you say I'll weigh the new baby next spring. No, you can't wait until next spring. Don't you have to weigh the new baby often? And the answer is yes, of course. To see what? To see whether it's gaining weight or it's losing weight. What if it's losing weight? The alarm bells have got to go off. You can't let a little baby lose weight very long. It's called disaster. These numbers are important. How often should you check the corporation to see if it's healthy or not? You say, well, in a couple of years, we'll get all the accountants together. No, you'll be out of business. In Las Vegas, the big gambling houses. Guess how often they put together a financial statement to see where they are several times a day? Why? So much is happening. If you don't learn when to shut down some of those tables, you'll be out of business by midnight. You can't wait till midnight. You can't wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow's too late. You've got to know the numbers. What is your cholesterol count? You don't know and you don't care. You've just got your fingers crossed for the future. 
We'd better come and get your family and take them to safety. Come on, be responsible for the set of your own sail. Leave it to no one else but yourself and learn to refine these numbers for yourself. How many pounds overweight should you be at age 50? John says, well, I've got big bones. Well, we'll give you 10 pounds sterling for big bones, but hey, 25, 30 pounds sterling, and we've got to turn on the caution light at home and at the office. Somebody says, what's that flashing caution light, John's? Up about 2020, 5.35 pounds sterling. 5.35 pounds sterling. And the flashing red light comes on at home and at the office. Somebody says, what's that flashing red light, John's? Up about 40 pounds sterling, 50 pounds sterling. And the siren goes off. Somebody says, what's that siren? John's over 50 pounds sterling. I'm asking you to take charge of your own life. Be responsible for your own life. Be responsible for your own retirement. Be responsible for your own health. Don't just drift along with the crowd. Those who don't care to be responsible about the number, meticulous about the numbers. Some of these numbers have got to be coming down like your cholesterol. Some of these numbers have got to be going up like the number of books in your library. Don't be satisfied until you've looked at all your own numbers and be responsible. Don't wait for somebody to come along. What if nobody comes along? You've got to be responsible yourself. Results are the name of the game. Let's check the numbers. Don't be satisfied with anything less than the best of numbers. Jesus walked along one day and saw a fig tree. Interesting story. And as Jesus looked suspiciously at this fig tree, he said to his disciples, does that fig tree have any figs? Do you think that's an important question? It is, I'm telling you, for a fig tree, it's an all important question. Does it have any figs? His disciples said, no, sir. Of all the trees you were to pick, this particular fig tree does not have any figs. The story says Jesus lost his cool. One of the few times he lost his cool. Why, I think, to make a point. A fig tree without figs, it is unacceptable. Jesus said, if that fig tree doesn't have any figs, I suggest you promptly take it out. And he added, why? Let it take up the ground. So you've got to get all your people together every once in a while and say, today we're counting the figs. What for? To see who gets to stay. Why? It's the name of the game. Results. Now, what if your results are not that good right now? What if you're going through some tough times and aren't quite sure what to do next? You know why I do seminars and lectures and write books and audio programs? So I can attend them all myself. Read it again myself. Listen again myself. I don't do it just to hear myself talk. And I don't do it for the money. I do it because the teacher always receives the greatest lessons he seeks to teach others. What's the best way out of a blue mood? Talk somebody else through theirs. What's the best way out of a mental energy slump? Talk somebody else through theirs. What's the best way to start solving your own problems? Talk to somebody else about theirs. Why? Because when you start talking someone else through their blue mood or their mental slump or their problem, you'll hear yourself say amazing things. You'll hear all the knowledge that you've gathered come out to help this other person and it will ultimately help you by hearing it again. It just works that way. It's often easier to tap our resources for somebody else than it is to tap them for ourselves. Sometimes defeat is the best beginning. Why? Well, for one, if you're at the very bottom, there's only one way to go up. But more importantly, if you're flat on your back mentally and financially, 
you'll usually become sufficiently disgusted to reach way down deep inside yourself and pull out miracles, pull out talents and pull out abilities and pull out desires and determination. When you're flat broke or flat miserable, you'll eventually become so disgusted that you'll pull out the basic essentials required to make everything better. And it's in the face of adversity that things begin to change, that you begin to change with enough disgust, desire, and determination to change your life. You'll start saying, I've had it. Enough of this. No more. Never again. Here's where the miracle begins. I've had it. Enough. No more. Never again. These words and these thoughts really rattle the power of time and fate and circumstances. And these three things, time and fate and circumstances, all get together and say, okay, okay. We can see that we have no power here. Here we're facing some major resolve. This guy's not going to give up. He's had it. He's done with all this nonsense. We better step aside and let this guy get by. Resolve, inspiration through disgust. But a lot of people don't change themselves. They wait for change circumstances to change the government, to change life, to change. What'll that do? Not much. These poor unfortunate folks accept their defeats and wallow in their self-pity. Why? Because they refuse to take control of the situation. They refuse to take control of their life, their career, their health, their relationships, their finances. They refuse to take control and take responsibility and get sufficiently disgusted to change it. But if you are disgusted, if you are making changes, if this program finds you in the middle of your own personal slump, then I have some words to offer you. Your present failure is a temporary condition. It is only a temporary condition. You will rebound from failure just as surely as you gravitated into failure. Somebody once suggested to me in about a failure that I should tell myself that this too shall pass. I firmly believe that you're only given as much as you can handle. 